Is it on? Here it is. Hello? Where are you? I wanted to share my testimony uh, of how we got into where we are today. Uh, we were in a charismatic church, a beautiful church, beautiful people. We loved them very much. But some things had happened, and uh, I was just kind of crying out for the Lord and saying, Lord, what's wrong with this picture? Something doesn't feel right. And I've been crying out to him, and this was my prayer. I was saying, Lord, I know there's a protocol in heaven and a blueprint, and I want the blueprint of heaven. And that was my prayer. Well, one day, on a Sunday, um, we were in church worshiping the Lord, and it was glorious, and I was had my eyes shut and my hands raised, and I was just worshiping, kind of lost in worship. And I saw the Lord in the spirit. I didn't see him with my eyes, but I saw him, and he was up front, and he was dancing. And he had on a blanket with a ZT and was twirling. And I was back here, and he was coming down the aisle dancing. And when he got to me, he leaned over and whispered in my ear. And I'll never forget it. And he said, Mercy, he said, you don't know who I am. I was like frozen in time, and because I knew him from a little girl. I was raised in church, the Foursquare Church, and it's in place of God, so I thought I knew him, but it's like my whole life flashed before my eyes, and I just was stunned, and I really couldn't say anything. I just was stunned, and um, after the service, pastor's wife came up to me, and she said, I saw the glory of the Lord all over you. And I didn't tell her at that time. But then I went home and I asked the Lord the next day, because Mondays always study on Mondays. And I went home and asked him, I said, what does this mean? And he just clearly said to me, return to the ancient paths. And he spoke to me about the Ten Commandments, and I started to look, and I said, well, Father, I'm doing all these except number four, keeping the Sabbath. And he said, it's for you. And then from that point, when we started keeping Sabbath in the homes, when everything began to unfold, and he said, return to, to the first 100 years when the original apostles were here and study them. So that's how I started. I started back in, the, back in there studying, you know, the original apostles. And that's how we got where we're at today, and that was 10 years ago. We're waiting on traps. They're not here yet. So, do you want to just continue with? We're waiting on the traps. Mm -hmm. Do you want to wait? Oh, you got to be out here by two thirty. Two thirty. At the latest. Okay. Well, then we better get moving. Okay. I don't. I don't feel so good about going up there. But my notes are on this iPad, and I can put the iPad on this little. Um, podium. So if it's okay with y'all, I'll come up here because it can hold the iPad and then I can see my notes. I just love listening to testimonies. And you know, those testimonies are there to encourage all of us. I think they're going to be very important in the days ahead for us to encourage each other with a scripture, with a song, with our testimony, because he gives those things to us, not just for us, but for the whole body of Messiah. Um, and are we going to turn those lights off? Is it possible? Okay. I'm so excited about today, and I know Marcy's been praying for three or four or five months for this day. So this is an awesome day, and I'm just going to run through the biblical scriptures about mikvah, about baptism, where the word baptism came from, and uh, if there are rules, biblical rules associated with this, what are they? And I think this is a really interesting teaching. Very likely, unless you've done an in-depth study of the mikvah, this is going to be new information. I found some things here that that were even surprising for me. Um, and there are 40 biblical verses connected with it. If you want us to email those to you, we can. 
I'm not going to take time to do 40 verses on it right now because we are limited in our time. Okay, like with these days, we find immersion shows us things about the Messiah. You know, we see pictures of Jesus or Yeshua in the feast days. Well, we see pictures of him in immersion, in water. We always keep him in the foreground of our studies, and we realize that all of these things are designed to give us a better understanding of what he has done for us. All things must be centered on him. Now, truthfully, the entire Bible is written about the Messiah. That's what Psalm 47, 40, verse 7 declares. This verse says that the volume of the book is about him. Rabbi Paul calls immersion in water and ritual purity an elementary teaching. You know, I don't know if I agree with Paul on this because there's so many things that are deep about this topic. But in, uh, in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, Rabbi Paul tells believers to leave the elementary teachings of the Messiah behind them and go on to the meat of the word. Now, in his mind, simple teachings are like milk. So let's see what he listed to be simple teachings, elementary teachings of the Messiah. It's on our next slide. We'll just wait. Uh, the work. next slide. There it goes. Is it up there? Great. Okay, so Paul says these are the elementary teachings. Repentance from dead works, faith, baptisms, meaning more than one, immersion, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Paul thinks those are simple? I don't, but he does. I think they're utterly profound. Paul is saying that once we understand these teachings, we're qualified to move on to the meat of the word, leaving the milk behind us. We're going to look at baptism, the mikvah, and some biblical rules for immersion. We will consider the spiritual meaning also, but we're going to begin with baptism. Now, baptism is what, uh, we have this on our next slide. Yes, baptism is what uh, is referred to as, uh, or immersion is referred to as baptism. But this Greek word for baptism is so interesting. interesting. It's called baptizo, and you've heard that before. I know you have. But it means to immerse or plunge into a liquid. And for the most part, if we have grown up in church, we understand that baptism started with John the Baptist. Most of us are ignorant of the fact that this is far from the truth. This word comes from the ancient Lebanese cloth dyeing industry. Bats held different colors of dye, and the process of placing the cloth into the vat of dye was called baptizo. As time passed, the ritual immersion of new believers began to be called baptism from this process. That's where it came from. Immersing in water, however, is at least a thousand years it's at least a thousand years older than the birth of the Messiah. Peter and the other followers of the Messiah were in an upper room on the Temple Mount on Shavuot, which is the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Thousands of pilgrims were in town for the feast. Many heard the violent rushing wind and they saw the tongues of fire dancing over the 120 believers. Peter began to preach to the pilgrims who gathered around, and suddenly 3,000 of them understood that Yeshua was the Messiah. As he was urging, they immersed in water to express their new trust in him and their new commitment to live for him. The pilgrims used the ritual baths, or the mikvot, which is the plural for mikvah, that were right there around the temple mount. There were many of them, uh, right there around the seven steps and also at the southeast corner. And we've been inside of some of those. It has been debated how 3,000 people could immerse in one day. However, each person entering the Holy Temple had to immerse in a mikvah. So everyone who had gone up there had immersed. There were a lot of them. There were ample mikvot, enough for each person going to a pilgrim feast to immerse. So it could handle 3,000 300,000 people. 
350,000 people fit on the Temple Mount. No one was ever lowered backward into the water. People immersed themselves, and that's how it was done in Scripture. They entered the water alone, and they crouched down like a fetus in the womb until the water covered them. This was something the Hebrew people knew how to do. In the first century, everyone knew how to immerse in the water, and they understood what it meant. The earliest drawing of Christian baptism is found on the wall of a second century Roman catacomb. It shows John standing on the bank of the Jordan River, helping Yeshua back up to shore after his immersion. John did not baptize Yeshua, but he witnessed the Messiah immersing himself. He did not touch him since that was never done. Later, any time Yeshua was on the Temple Mount, he had to immerse in a mikvah before ascending the steps to go up to the courtyard. Everybody did. Baptism illustrates in a dramatic way the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. That's what scripture tells us. This is biblical. It also illustrates our dying to sin and starting a new life in him. Going under the water represents death to sin, and emerging from the water represents a cleansed life and a new relationship with Yeshua. Romans 6, 4 puts it this way. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We know that our guilt before God is removed the moment that we trust Him. That's the moment it happens. But immersion is a testimony. We are acting on the truth that something amazing has happened in our hearts. We are testifying without words that we have turned from an old life of sin to a new life in the Messiah. And we are identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection through the act of water immersion. Christians believe that baptism is something that we do once. Yet the Bible gives reasons for a person to immerse many times. The word mikvah actually comes from the creation story. And I really worked hard on this next slide. I wanted to, it to be really pretty. Genesis 1.10 states, God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Gathering of the waters is the word mikvah. So mikvah comes from Genesis 1.10. Gathering of waters is mikvah. Now it refers to natural waters like oceans, rivers, and rainwater that is collected in an underground pool. It is living water, not stagnant water. Ponds, lakes, rivers, and oceans can all be a mikvah. But the most highly respected water, according to the Hebrew people, is water from a spring or a river. Now, Yeshua understood this, and for this reason, when he immersed in the Jordan River in Matthew 3.16, he stated that he was fulfilling all righteousness. That included being in a river, and not just a stone mikvah around the Temple Mount. Now, a mikvah is not a work of man. It's not invented by man. God is the originator of immersion. The idea of total immersion comes from Leviticus 15, 16, where it mentions washing all of the flesh in water. Ritual purification was decreed by God himself. The mikvah, mikvah was so important in first century Israel that if a community or a village only had enough money to build either a synagogue or a mikvah, they built the mikvah first. They built the mikvah first. Life for an average Israeli in a typical village in Yeshua's lifetime depended on access to a mikvah. Immersion in a mikvah was designed to correct the condition of uncleanness and restore someone who is ritually impure to a state of purity. Now, this is a picture of a first century mikvah in Jerusalem. It is located on the south side of the Temple Mount in the Ophel, and the Ophel is just the land between the Temple Mount and the city of David. If you have been to Israel and gone inside the Davidson Archaeology Park, this is very close to the Holda Gate and the Seven Steps. I have to tell you, the inside of that archaeology park is my favorite place in Jerusalem. I go in there and I'm transported to the first century and I don't ever want to leave there. I could spend all my time in Jerusalem inside the Davidson Archaeology Park. 
Now this mikvah was hidden for many centuries under dirt and overgrowth until it was discovered and excavated by archaeologists. Now the design of this one is very unique. It's compared with the slides that we are about to see because those slides, in those slides, the mikvahs or the mikvot are very simple. This one's very elaborate. And so they've suggested that perhaps the Kohanim or the priests used this mikvah. Now, nearly every public mikvah was much smaller and less ornate. Most of them look like this one. A mikvah had to be built into the ground or be part of a building that was attached to the ground. It could not be a vessel, a tub, a vat, or a barrel which could be picked up and carried away. This mikvah and its steps were built by chiseling down into the limestone bedrock to create a pool large enough for an average-sized person to immerse his whole body. It was approximately nine feet wide by six feet long. It held 40 sia of water, about 200 gallons. But the measurement of 40 was what was important for the Hebrew people because it related to the 40 days that the rain fell on the earth during Noah's flood. It took 40 days to purify the earth, therefore it takes 40 sias to purify those who immerse. Now here's a little secret from the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew word for Mayan, for water, is Mayan, or Mayan. You know how, you know that word. But it begins with the letter Mim, and it ends with the letter Mim. And the letter Mim has a numeric value of 40, relating to the 40 days it rained on the earth and the 40 seas of water in the mikvah. Everything in the Hebrew language has some additional meaning. All right, now, the waters of a mikvah consisted of collected rainwater, and, uh, or they were channeled from a nearby spring into a pool. People avoided using metal, clay, or wooden pipes, since these could become defiled. They carved stone channels for the water instead. No other liquid except mayam hayam, or living water, went into the mikvah. No bath salts, no bubble bath. The mikvah was not for the purpose of bathing to be physically clean. People who immersed were already bathed. They immersed for sanctification and separation from the world. The mikvah was symbolic of the womb and new life. Of the 50 mikvahs or mikvot around the Temple Mount, most feature two sets of stairs like this one with a small divider wall between them and the wall served to separate the clean side from the unclean side. This picture was taken from inside. Now that's a picture we all take when we go to the Davidson Archaeology Park because we all take turns going down there and taking a picture with our camera because these are not actively used today. They're just, you know, they're from the first century. So it's awesome to go down there and just imagine being in the first century. So this is taken from inside the mikvah, carved into the limestone bedrock near the southeast corner of the Temple Mount. The entrance on the, is on the right side, which is our left, when we look at the slide. That was used for descending down into the water. And then the other side was the exit stairway where a person would as ascend from the water after purification. Every worshiper coming to the temple would immerse before entering the temple courtyard. So the demand for a mikvah was quite high. Dozens had been excavated around the temple mount, and there are proof that water baptism did not begin with John the Baptist. John was not doing anything radical or new. Immersing in a mikvah was a common practice long before John began preaching at the Jordan River. When Peter preached on Shavuot and in Acts chapter 2, and 3,000 new believers immersed, they used a mikvah just like this one to demonstrate their new faith in Yeshua, just like we do. But they did it in the biblical manner they were accustomed to. Here are a few examples of how the mikvah became part of everyday life in Israel. At Mount Sinai, every Israelite, along with a mixed multitude from Egypt, immersed in water and washed their clothes in preparation for receiving the Ten Commandments. Anyone who touched something dead also had to immerse, according to Numbers 19. Anyone who ate something dead had to immerse, according to Leviticus 17, 15. Those suffering with skin disease would immerse, 
according to Leviticus 14.9. A woman finishing her monthly cycle had to immerse in a mikvah. Now this is what Bathsheba was doing when King David spotted her in 2 Samuel 11.2. A woman giving birth also immersed after childbirth to fulfill Leviticus 12, 4, and 5. Before any worshiper could enter the temple grounds in Jerusalem, he had to immerse in a mikvah. And that comes from Exodus 30, verse 20. This was especially important for the feast days. Immersing was a sign of purity and repentance. It also sensitized people to the holiness of the day, and it prepared them in their hearts to meet with God. This is why today's the day in Israel that people are starting to immerse for Yom Kippur, which starts on Tuesday night. We read in John 11.55 that Passover was near, and many people were going up to Jerusalem to purify themselves. The Greek word for purify in this verse comes from a word meaning sacred, and holy. Okay, in our, our, our next slide, we see that people immerse all their cooking pots and their eating utensils if they were manufactured by non-Hebrews. It's true. Some Hebrew men immerse before praying or studying because they believe that Ezra had decreed this. Now that's a, another tradition. Purification in a mikvah could be done at home if a family had a stone hewn mikvah. We remember that Yeshua turned the water inside those six giant stone jars into wine. This water was intended for a mikvah, according to John 2, 6. A mikvah required 150 to 200 gallons of water, and each of those six pots held 30 gallons. So together, those six pots would provide 180 gallons for a mikvah the community mikvah, which was there where the wedding was being held in, in Cana. Now, certain religious groups like the Essenes were called dawn bathers. They took ritual baths daily because they wanted to be ready for the coming of the Messiah, and they thought he could come any day. The early church fathers called them Hemero Baptists, meaning daily bathers. Now, every time a scribe wrote the name of God, he immersed in a mikvah. A man from the tribe of Levi, a son of Aaron, did not assume or perform his priestly duties until he had gone through a mikvah in Exodus 29, 4 and 5. Without immersion in a mikvah, conversion to Judaism was not valid. And you see, as believers in Messiah, we've adopted that. Okay, also, King Herod built many mikvahs or mikvot at his desert fortress of Masada. It's as dry as a bone up there, but they had a way to collect the water and to store it so they could use it in the mikvah. Now, wealthy priests in the first century built as many as nine mikvot inside their personal homes, which excavators are now discovering. And as the high priest conducted the service on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he immersed in a mikvah five times. There was an additional place for the high priest to immerse on the Mount of Olives before he burned the red heifer to get ashes of purification. A special arched ramp led to that mikvah from the Temple Mount. As it was built as a bridge over the Kidron Valley, and it was also a bridge over a bridge to keep his shadow from falling on a grave. Tradition. But they're trying so hard to be pure before the Lord. The great thing as believers is that it just, it feels a little bit easier to be pure before the Lord. Josephus tells us that even during the, war, the years of war, from the year 66 to the year 73, ritually immersing in a mikvah was foremost for the people of Israel. When people became believers, their immersion in a mikvah represented being born of water and of spirit. In John 3, 5, the Yeshua states, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It's natural to wonder what being born of water actually means in this verse. Does it mean being born in the birth water of a mother? 
Or does it mean being born, <coughs> being a nursing daughter of separation, which is what a mikvah is? A mikvah demonstrates that one, that one is separated from the world. The waters of separation in the mikvah required faith to be truly purifying and to cleanse the inner person. Now that we're familiar with baptism and the mikvah, let's examine the rules for immersion. People went under the water three times in a mikvah because the word mikvah occurs three times in the Torah. This is a traditional practice. So the biblical rules in scripture are these. Immersion requires water, Matthew 3.11. It requires going down in the water, 2 Kings 5.14. And it requires coming up out of the water, Matthew 3.16 and Acts 8.39. And this is what the Bible says about the method of, of immersion. The first rule of immersion takes us right to John the Baptist. Now, I used to wonder why John led people to immerse in the Jordan River. After all, John was a priest. He very likely was the legitimate high priest as the son of Zechariah. He could have taken his message of repentance to the temple. Instead, he went to the Jordan River just north of the Dead Sea near Jericho. Now this is precisely where Elijah ascended to heaven in a chariot of fire. John wore camel hair, which means he was dressed like Elijah. And he began his ministry in the exact location where Elijah ended his. Isn't that interesting? Knowing this history makes John's ministry in the Jordan come alive. Now we know why he went to that location. The first rule of immersion is that it requires water. We cannot immerse in the air. We cannot immerse in the dirt. We cannot immerse in fire. We would be injured. Immersion requires water. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist is speaking. He says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John had the priestly authority to lead people to repent. He was a priest. And he was called by God to do this. He used the Jordan River as the waters of separation. After immersing, repentant people were separated from their former sins and they had a desire to live right for God. The element of water is connected with the Spirit according to this verse. The Spirit of God is frequently represented as being poured out like water upon His people. In Proverbs 1.23, Isaiah 44.3, and Joel 2.28 and 29, all of these say that God pours out His Spirit, and the word for pour in these verses is the same word used for pouring out water. Water is a great cleansing agent. The ashes of the red heifer were not effective unless they were mixed in water. Water was also the cleansing for skin disease in Leviticus 14, 1 through 8. Water is a great separator and a sanctifier. Water consecrated men for the priesthood in Leviticus 8, 6. It brings the remission of sins according to Acts 2, 38 and Acts 22, 16. Immersion causes regeneration, according to Titus 3.5, Mark 16.16, 16, and 1 Peter 3.21, just to name a few verses. Now, you, got, you all gave David your email addresses, and if you like, I can send you the list of all the scriptures that deal with the myth, but that might be something you'll want to hang on to. Yes. The next rule of immersion is that it required going down in the water. In 2 Kings 5.14, the commander of the, uh, of the army of Aram had come to Elisha to be cleansed of his, his skin disease. And 2 Kings 5.14 states, Then he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again un, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So he immersed in the in the Jordan River to follow Elisha's directions. Dipping seven times, however, was a, divine, a sign of a divine covenant with God because of the number seven. 
and the commander's care depended on that covenant. Seven is a symbol of the covenant. Not only was his skin disease removed, but his flesh became softer and more tender than that of a grown man. It was like the flesh of a young child, and he was completely clean. Now the final rule of immersion is that one must come up out of the water. What good would it do to remain down in the water? We have too much work to do for the kingdom. We can't stay in the water. Several ancient Hebrew accounts specifically mention the coming up out of the waters of separation, like the high priest on the Day of Atonement, or like anyone who immerses. We must come up. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, Yeshua comes up from his mikvah in the Jordan River, completing his immersion with such a momentous occasion that the heavens are opened to him. The Holy Spirit alights on him in the form of a dove, and John saw it. An ancient Hebrew writing has a little commentary about the dove that Noah released from the ark. They, you know, the third time the dove did not return to Noah. And they say, poetically, they suggest that the dove was waiting in heaven for just the right moment when a door would open in heaven and that dove would go, come down with a crown in its beak and place it on the head of King Messiah. When I read uh, Jewish stories like that, I get excited because they prove that when Yeshua went into the water, he went in as the carpenter's son, and when he came out, he came out as King Messiah. King Messiah. So it's no accident that a dove came down. Okay, now after the dove, God spoke in an audible voice, and the people standing nearby heard him. In Acts 8, 39, we read this. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Now let me just say, first off, that there's a mistranslation in the text identifying this man as a eunuch. Why is that true? He has just come from the temple. And according to the Torah, eunuchs could not go to the temple. So if he just came from the temple, he wasn't a eunuch. But the primary message here is his joy. After he came up from the water, he had so much joy because he knew the truth about Isaiah's prophecy that it pointed to Yeshua. He went on his way rejoicing because he had found the key to the scriptures and his soul was set free. Now that was good news. He had good tidings of great joy to take back to Ethiopia and share with his countrymen. Eusebius, an early historian, claims that he did just that that he became the first preacher of the gospel in Ethiopia, and they planted a flourishing church there. Now, this account is repeated in almost every ancient history of Ethiopia. We have examined baptism, the mikvah, and the biblical rules for immersion. Now, let's look at the spiritual meaning. The waters of the mikvah are specifically intended for sanctification. Whatever passes through the water, uh, waters of separation is separated from the world cleansed, purified, sanctified, and holy. For ancient Torah teachers, the waters of the mikvah were like the womb of the world. One who came up from the water had a change of status. He was like a newborn child, a child of just one day. The waters of the mikvah implied a new birth. Waters are, uh, rather, writers of the Brit Hadashah, or New Testament, use similar phrases. They say, born anew, Born again, new creation, and born from above. In each case, the idea is separation from the world. The waters of the Red Sea were a type of mikvah. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2 states, Our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The Red Sea were provided waters of separation. It separated Israel from the Egyptians. The children passed through the waters on the way to the Promised Land and were sanctified from Egyptian defilement. Passing through waters of separation signifies passing from idols to the true God, passing from death to new life in the Messiah, and passing from darkness into the light of God's truth. Who provides waters of separation for us? Who separates us through water from our own personal Egypt, from our own place 
of our personal place of darkness and sin. Jeremiah 17, 12 and 13, it states, A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Our Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Now look at the word hope in this verse. Tikva is the word for Hebrew word for hope. But the word for hope in this verse is not tikva, it's mikvah. Mikvah. This indicates that our Messiah is the cleansing fountain or a mikvah. While Yeshua is still hung on the crucifixion stake, a Roman soldier pierced his side. Immediately outflowed blood and water in John 19, 34. The blood was an atonement for sin. The water was a mikvah. The soldier opened the cleansing fountain from the side of Yeshua, spoken of in Jeremiah 17, 13. He proved that Yeshua was the mikvah for all who believe. Zechariah 13, 1 also speaks of the fountain for the house of David, which deals with sin and uncleanness. Yeshua is that fountain. He tells the woman at the well in John 4 that he is Mayim Hayim, or living water. He tells all Israel the same thing in John 7, 37, on the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeshua is a mikvah, a source of spiritual cleansing, and our purifying waters. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, in the complete Jewish Bible, I'm just going to read it. It says this, Messiah loved the Messianic community, slash the church. Indeed, he gave himself up on its behalf in order to set it apart for God, making it clean through immersion in the mikvah, so to speak, in order to present the messianic community slash the church to himself as a bride to be proud of, without a spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but holy and without defect. We have examined baptism, the mikvah, and the biblical rules for immersion and the spiritual meaning of the mikvah. And now we're going to see how the mikvah applies to us. Let's recall that Aaron and his sons had to immerse in a mikvah before they could be priests. As believers, aren't we the, a kingdom of priests? As believers, we're immersed into the Messiah as a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. Re Revelation 1.16 says we're a kingdom of priests. So does Peter, so does Exodus 19.6. When Rabbi Paul told people in Acts 19 to immerse for Yeshua, they were confused. They had already immersed in John's baptism. He explained that John's immersion was for repentance and becoming ritually pure. Yeshua's immersion was for faith in the Son of God. So the people immersed again in the name of Yeshua. Now honestly, let me say, there's not enough water in the world to wash away our sins. There's not. Only the blood of Yeshua can do that. But immersion is a statement to the world that God's mercy and the blood of Yeshua has saved and renewed us. It is a sign of newfound purity, of what's already taken place in our hearts. For this reason, immersion symbolically elevates us to a higher degree of holiness, and it changes our spiritual status. We feel differently when we come out of the mikvah. It is an outward demonstration that we've accepted the covenants of God inside our hearts. A good example of immersion into the Messiah is recorded in Acts 9. Rabbi Paul accepted the covenant of the Messiah. You remember the, the road to Damascus and everything that happened to him. As soon as he realized who the Messiah was and his, his, he could see again because he was blind for three days, he wanted to immerse in a mikvah before he even ate. And he went and did that. Later, Cornelius and his group, the first Gentiles to believe, accepted the covenant and were immersed into the Messiah. Now, how does immersion relate to believers without a temple standing in Jerusalem? We are each a temple of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. To officiate as priests in our temples, we immerse. Symbolically, emerging from the mikvah is very much like the birthing process. The mikvah represents a womb. When a person enters the mikvah, he is re-entering the womb. 
And when he emerges, it is as if he is, he is born again. Thus he attains a completely new status. This is what Yeshua was talking about when he said we must be born of water and of spirit. The mikvah also represents the grave. When a person immerses, he is temporarily in a state of non-living. When he emerges, he is figuratively resurrected with a totally new status. Now, the, represent the representation of a mikvah is both a womb and the grave is not a contradiction. Both birth and death are end points in the cycle of life. It is interesting to note that the Hebrew word kever, K-E-V-E-R, means grave, but sometimes it's used in scripture for the word womb. Isn't that interesting? So whether a person is passing through the mikvah or through death, he's attaining a new status. Hebrews 10.22 explains, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The person who emerges from the water is like a newborn child whose past is washed away, leaving only his future with God. Of course, this does not deny that there were good and beautiful aspects of our past. But in the strictest sense, that past was only a prologue to a future life in the Messiah. The mikvah water gives us new eyes to see and a fresh spirit. John the Baptist actually began his ministry at this time of year in preparation for the High Holy Days. His message was one of rebuke and warning. He was, he was stressing that people needed to, uh, to hurry. He gave them, he pressed them with an urgency to repent before it was too late. He called people to turn around and go back to God before the coming of the Lord, which is code language for the Feast of Trumpets, which was about to begin when he started his ministry. Multitudes came to John in preparation for the holy days, especially Yom Kippur, which begins in just over 48 hours. This is the season of the year when John led people to immerse for repentance. Their immersion was an outward sign that looked like death, death to self, and an end to selfish motives. Immersion in the mikvah is an outward sign for us of the changes which the Holy Spirit has made inside our hearts. In light of this, do we need to immerse in a mikvah? In the Bible, a mikvah is not a once-in-a-lifetime event, but an action to be experienced over and over again. When we remember that the first miracle Yeshua performed was to turn mikvah water into wine at the wedding, we can think about our future wedding. Our immersion can be a rehearsal for the future when the bride is prepared to the when the bride is prepared for the Messiah and presented to him without spot or blemish. Just as in marriage, where vows are sometimes renewed. We sometimes need to renew and reaffirm our covenant with the Messiah. Immersion is one way to do this, and it allows God to beautify our spirits as he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The mikvah is a powerful spiritual tool, perhaps one of the most fundamental keys in divine service to God. For those who want to do a mikvah today, we have the ability to do so. We're going to use the baptistry to which we've added some Mayim Hayim, living water. And one of us can be a witness like John the Baptist who attended Yeshua's immersion. The witness sees that every strand of hair is under water. Upon arising from the water, we can pray a Hebrew prayer if we want to. It's not required, it's only a tradition. But I brought one with me for anyone who wants to use that prayer. But truly, praying directly from our hearts is preferable. God, however, wants all of our prayers, no matter where they come from. So ask yourself if you would like to do a mikvah today. It's not required. But if anything has stirred in your heart and you want to do that, we have the ability to do that today. And I'm so excited about this. And I'm so grateful to this congregation and this church that has allowed us to come in here and just immerse as we remember what our Messiah has done for us. And also to remember that we are his bride. That we are going to be presented to him one day. 
without spot or blemish. It's a wonderful thing to do. So decide in your heart if you, if you want to, because if you do, we have the ability to do that. And what we thought we would do as we begin is to, is to let the ladies go first and just to ask the gentlemen to go out there so that we have a private time with the Lord in, in modesty. And, and then the men can, can immerse in a mikvah if they want to. It's, it's just a symbol of a new beginning. And it's a wonderful thing to do. Marcy, is there something you'd like to say?